On Beyond the OR, Dr. B will take you beyond plastic surgery. Listen as he talks with doctors, friends, people who have inspired him along the way, and patients whose lives he's changed with your host, Dr. Kevin Brenner. Guys, today we are so excited. We have an Emmy award-winning writer, producer, and comedian, Hugh Fink. You might know him from a little show called SNL. He has written so many of your favorite sketches. I can't wait to talk to him. Dr. Brenner, we were talking about this. Aren't we super excited? Anytime someone mentions SNL, I'm super excited. I know, I love humor. And and Hugh Fink. Oh, and Hugh Fink, of course. He has also written for um, people like Jennifer Aniston, Steve Carell, Lenny Kravitz, Steve Martin, Sting, the list goes on and on. And we're gonna jump right in here. We are so excited to have Hugh. And um, please help us welcome Hugh Fink. I love it. (laughs) Was that intro okay? Elizabeth's really good. I want to hear how you are now. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I, I would have stumbled on half of that. She was yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. But she left out lots of stuff. That's okay. That's okay. For an we, intro, we got, we got she time. understands less is more. We got- <laughs> you oversell someone. You know, I used to... to that, that's easy to for do. For comedians who I didn't like when early in my career, if I had to introduce them, they would be very arrogant about, make sure you say this about me. Right. So what I would do is, I would say their credit, then I'd go, he's also a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Uh, he won the Nobel. He is working on a cure for cancer. I, so that way the audience would think everything I said was bullshit. Pad, pad their CV a little so bit. So much that yeah. then they lose all credibility. <laughs> well, good. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you le- we left out, I mean, we, we, we left stuff, out a is... few names that you that you are close to. It's fine. Will Ferrell. My favorite. Tina Fey. Love her. Tracy Morgan. David Spade. Spade's really... Well, you actually uh, uh, wrote a show. For created a show. For created a, what it was called. Way ahead of its time, the Showbiz Show. On uh, Comedy Central. Correct. It was. This is before TMZ, before all that stuff. And you know, David was famous for doing Hollywood Minute. There was he a would, time before TMZ. It was like sick, scary, and wow. he would really make fun of celebrities in ways that people weren't used to, like really hard hitting stuff. And I shared that with him, so I created a whole show around the idea of taking the piss out of Hollywood. Right. And it upset people. <laughs> There were some people. Then it was really mad. good. It was really, it was really funny. <laughs> you got to take that to the Oscars. Seriously, we would have, of course, done a whole half hour on that. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So Hugh, I got to tell you, Will Ferrell, I, I've I've said this is the dream guy. Writing for him, I'm sure was incredible. One of the sketches that I saw, which was El Nino with Chris, love Chris Farley. Love it. Will Ferrell and um, the uh, the guy that plays uh, Ric Flair, who was a comedian like uh, Jim Brewer. Jim, Jim Brewer. Brewer. That sketch, I just got to tell you. He's also the goat. Goat man. Oh, the goat boy. man. Go boy. Go boy. Go boy. My mother is ill right now, and I was a rough day yesterday. And when I'm researching for the show, I literally had. Crying. Oh, that tears. makes me feel so good. It made me feel so good. Comedy is, I feel, very healing. It, yeah, you, you know what sketch he's talking about, Dr. Brenner. I mean, you know the sketch. I, I have quoted El Nino. <laughs> I have said, for, I could call my brother right now and just be like, hey, Greg, what, what does El Nino mean? And he'll be like, it's Spanish for the Nino. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, once I came up with that line, I'm like, this sketch is done. I mean, right, because that, that's all you need. No matter what else is in it, people will love that line. It was genius. Thank you. And, and like, so you've had, I was telling Elizabeth, you've written sketches that I, before I ever knew who you were, have been quoting for my entire life because I'm a little bit of an SNL addict, and uh, which is remarkable, right? It and is remarkable. It's, well, it's, it's remarkable to do, I mean, whether it's comedy or music, it's remarkable to, to create anything that people reiterate time and time again. Yes, I I think that um, early in my career, I was creating for myself and wanting people to laugh. I never really put it in the context of, will this have any lasting impact? Now that I'm more seasoned, I can look back and go, how flattering that things that came out of my comedic sensibility, there are people, young and old, who still quote or enjoy. You're actually funny. Well, that I do. You've been verified. I've been verified. <laughs> but I think comedy, unlike music, I always say 
comedy doesn't last as long in a good way. Meaning classic songs you can listen to for 50 years. Unfortunately, a lot of comedy dates poorly. Something that seems hilarious in 1985, if you watch it now, a still, lot of times- Still hilarious. You think so? For me. For you. Yeah. But I think right. it depends what. You know, I just think that some comedy just has a poorer shelf life, let's say. Well, and to piggyback on that, do you feel like right now in this PC world that we live in, that some stuff hasn't, is it, is it harder as a writer, as a comedian, to be able to be as free as you were maybe in the 80s or 90s where there wasn't so much now focus on being PC and all this awareness that's happening? It definitely impacts your creativity. I think I've done it so long that, um, I'd like to think that stuff doesn't really get in the way of what I want to do. But if I were a new comedian, absolutely. It would make me much more fearful of, uh, if I say that at a club and someone tapes me and what if it hurts my career? Right. I never gave that any thought. I was pretty fearless. And I'm known among comedians to be pretty fearless. And because I am Jewish, but from, from Indiana, I have all these, you know, I could definitely get away with stuff on stage that a lot of comedians couldn't get away with. What took you down a path of comedy? Being an outsider, wanting to rebel against the establishment, because I, I did feel like an outsider where I grew up. I wasn't mistreated. I just was an outsider. So my way of being an outsider was to make fun of the inside. And, and when did you um, leave Indianapolis to? For college. I wanted the hell out. Not not because you wanted to start writing comedy. You, it wasn't like you didn't pull a letterman where you move out of Indiana and go out straight to Out of my to hometown, Manhattan, right. So, see, he stuck around doing the local weather and radio till he was almost 30 years old because I used to listen to Dave and <clears> thought he was a genius. And then you were on his show. Then I was on the show. Yeah. But I got out at 18. I knew by age 16 I wanted the hell out of Indiana. Not to join the Army. No, not okay. join the Army. But I did do... I left to study acting and do stand-up, but I didn't really, at that point, know how this will be a career. But I thought, I think I, it could be a career. I just wasn't sure how. And how do you, I mean, I always find it interesting. I have friends who are you know, TV and movie writers and stuff, and, and I, that is, you know, you write something and it appeals to an audience. Comedy is very, I, I find to be a very personal thing, right? Especially when you're writing for someone else. Like how, how do you, how do you when you're in your process writing, you're like tailor it for a specific comedian that you know is going to hit a specific tar target. I have audience. this ability to sort of channel them into me. <clears throat> so if I watch a, I'm talking about good talented people. If I watch a good comedian and they've got a point of view, I can easily adapt myself to their voice. So then I'll write stuff. Not 100% they'll say it's in their voice, but sometimes they'll go, wow, this really sounds like me. I've just always been able to do that. I don't care, I can do it with men, women, black, white, doesn't matter. That's so do you find that um, writing, do you write for the actual person and the audience, or do you first do what you think the audience will, is able to receive? It's, I think my intrinsic nature as a stand-up is I know what an audience is going to like, so I would never write anything that I don't think they're going to like. That's a given. Right. I don't want to write something that's not going to be funny for an audience. As as a audience member, I I get very nervous. Like when I go to the improv for the comedian, for the not, comedian. not for me. Right. Like you know, everyone goes. You like you're like I want to, I want to have a good couple hours, and have a couple drinks, and enjoy the night and laugh. Right. I, I just find that to be doing that and listening to live music is like, it's just like just. A, you know, a joy, right? I, I, but when, when a comedian gets up there and just doesn't connect, it's, it's like, it hurts me. It hurts, <laughs> see, it makes me mad. <laughs> like when I was a kid, I'd go to uh, comedy clubs and heckle comics who I thought sucked. And my friends, I was like, dude, you better be careful. But I, I had this attitude of like, but they're professional. They should be funnier. Not necessarily, right? Not necessarily, yes. but at least they're at a club a stent, I paid money to get in, so I feel like right. it's not open you mic want, you want your You want your money's worth. Yeah. yeah, so I just feel like it's their job to be good. So were you doing the stand-up circuit before you started writing for TV? Definitely. I did, I did stand-up for 11 years. Wow. Full-time. Started as an opener, 
ended up as a headliner, doing television, doing Rodney Dangerfield's last Young Comedian special. All wow. that I did before I had written for television. And so when you were on Letterman, that was during your stand-up days? That was during my, interestingly, that was during my days when I was doing less stand-up because I was a full-time television writer, but I still kept up my stand-up. I just didn't travel. I wasn't making a living on the road as I used to. By the way, I'm, I'm now thinking about this. I'm, I'm hoping that whoever's watching this podcast remembers who David Letterman is. Oh, gosh, don't say that. He's, yeah. like, he's like the king. He is the best. Well, but most people have no idea who Johnny Carson is. The, I right? forget that. Anyone <laughs> under 55 has no forget, idea who I mean, Carson is. Jay right? Leno, maybe. No one knows Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> exactly. That's right. Well, Hugh, you are now, um, this summer, for the first time ever, Harvard, you are going to be teaching sketch comedy writing at Harvard. How did that come about? It came about because during the pandemic, I was bored, right? Television shut down. I couldn't go to comedy clubs. I was thinking, what other creative skills do I have to take advantage of? And I thought, well, I've always been a good communicator with young comedians, younger comedians, and I'll bet there'd be a market for me to do some teaching in a high end. So swear to God, I woke up one morning, I don't know why this particular morning, and I wrote a cover letter that I adjusted to each place. I wrote like 30 universities, the top wow. ones. And like I did- you're applying for college. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, I did a Google search of um, top television and film programs in the country. So of course, you can guess which ones came up. USC, NYU, um, Chapman, Syracuse, you know, okay. so it's like that. So I wrote, over about four days, I wrote the, the heads of the departments, and I got incredible responses. Wow. But one of the places that responded was Harvard. Yeah. And and, and all these places, I did Zoom interviews, sometimes with one person, sometimes with a group. And Harvard said, they had screenwriting. I think they maybe have had sitcom writing, but they never had late night writing or sketch writing, which is what I want to do. So is this going to be an in-person endeavor? This one's going to be a Zoom class for graduate and undergraduates, 14 sessions. It's for a grade. They get four credits. They take it very seriously. You're going to be grading students. I am. Ugh. That's incredible. But yeah. how, how awesome is that? It's cool. To have somebody with your resume be, and them having access to, because uh, you are kind of an icon in well, comedy. thank so. you, but that was the selling point is, if people are paying a lot of money to study writing at this level, right, You, if I was a student going to Harvard, I'd want to have the best faculty. So I think they're smart about it is, it's not that I need a PhD or master's. My PhD is my resume, it's right? Your experience, <laughs> yeah. It's my experience, <laughs> and that's what I'm selling to these students, and hopefully, that will count a lot. I went to NYU, which even then was one of the top film TV acting programs in the country. And, and they didn't want you back as an alumnus, huh? How dare you? No, they actually, they've offered they me did. a job. They Here's did. what's happened. But Harvard was definitely more appealing. Harvard's more appealing. Now you're Ivy League. And Harvard's letting me do it from LA this summer. NYU literally wanted me in the city this summer. And it's like, dudes, I can't. It's too, come hu to it's too humid. Too really humid. Yeah. But I would like to go back. I would like to go to NYU. But um, when I was at NYU as a student, David Mamet, the brilliant <gasps> screenwriter, right. they brought him as a guest speaker. Wow. And he was already famous. He was a famous playwright. And I remember going, God, this is David Mamet. And I loved it. He, the first thing he says was, OK, uh, you can all write this down. Hollywood is bullshit. <laughs> Don't believe this is, I'm 18 years old. And this is this famous guy. That's what he's telling us. But it was great. So I always feel like. And was, if, he, was he right? Yes, of course yes. he was right, of course. So I hope right. that I can instill that same type of humor and levity along with you know teaching the craft of what I do. Well, and you know, humor for me is a healing th thing that, that um, in every situation that is bad uh, that I've been in, I've always tried to find the humor. It's what makes me feel good. What is your inspiration um, uh, to find the funny in something? Like what inspires you to go, oh, this? There's certain themes and tropes that clearly, even since I was a kid, that I gravitate toward to find humor. One is hypocrisy. I hate hypocrisy. And so I like to call it out. So politics. In a funny yeah. way. Politics. Yeah. I hate 
believe it or not, mediocrity. Now that's subjective, right? Because someone could look at a painting and go, that's beautiful, but someone else could go, it's not that good. Yeah. But I mean like, what I mean by mediocrity is people who attempt to do work where it's just okay. They just are, are they're okay at less than. Less than, yeah. and maybe no. it's like merely well, competent. It's the same with what I do. I mean, like you got you got to shoot for the stars. You, you, can't, for you stars. can't you can't just like be like, eh, that's a exactly. You want to be the best. I did the right side, left side, eh. Exactly. You, you got to really nail it. That's right. So hypocrisy, mediocrity, and then the other one is, um, of course, you can attest to this is um, self importance, arrogance, self promote, and of course since. That's worse. So, that's worse in plastic surgery than it is in comedy. I think probably. Yeah, probably is. <laughs> it or is just as bad. It is. But yeah, I so have this thing about people who use any opportunity to promote themselves at the expense of someone else's tragedy or someone else's joy. Or, that that's something I really harp on. Right. And all those things make me. I always find the funny in those. Is it therapeutic? At totally. Times? Oh my gosh. Totally therapeutic. And to me, what's therapeutic is to really be hard hitting about that stuff. But that's what's great about comedy is we all, there's different points of views, right? Yeah. Do you think that comedy, um, you have to push the lines at times? Uh, no, totally. That's why I got into comedy and love comedy. And when I think when people miss the opportunity to push the lines or refuse to, that bums me out. So I know, I know your answer to this is going to be, your upcoming Harvard class, but like if you look back at your career, like what was your favorite? Oh, what was your favorite thing to do? Was it your LA, your TV show about LA? Was it Comedy Central with David Spade? Was it your years at SNL? Was it stand up comedy? What, what did you I enjoy? I can say there's one most? night that I'll never have one that's more amazing, and that is. Um, you know, I'm a classical violinist. I studied since I was a little kid. Right. Wow. And I used to use violin in my stand-up, and then I stopped using it. But then people were like, the violin was great. So I slowly started to bring it back. So in 2000, I think, John Stewart was doing Carnegie Hall for the Toyota Comedy Festival and asked me to open for him at Carnegie Hall. And wow. you know, the old comedian Alan King, who was a legend mm -hmm. back in the day, Alan King hosted the show. So Alan came out, did his time. Alan King brought me out. So here I am, a classical violinist, doing a sold out show at Carnegie Hall. Wow. Me on stage. And it was that was heaven. Violin or comedy? But vi Both. Vi Violin comedy, comedy. Correct. Comedy, but I incorporated, I closed with the violin. So the crowd went crazy. And when Br John Stewart, he and his manager picked me. I mean, I think they, I'd like to think they picked me because they liked my stand up and thought I was appropriate, but they also thought, what a nice icing on the cake that you actually play the violin well. So I came out, killed. John Stewart comes out after me. It's Carnegie Hall. He steps on stage and goes, what a shithole. <laughs> <laughs> funny line. He's funny. Yeah. He's funny. So, so okay. That is incredible. Of your, I was kind of thinking back about like all all the sketches that you and I have discussed. What what do you think? Can you like rank, I don't know if you want to rank them or just, like what was your favorite sketch that you ever wrote for, at SNL? I think it was the series I did of Norm Macdonald <clears throat> doing a senile Larry King. <laughs> oh, I saw that. Yes, that, <laughs> yes, I did. And I did like four of them. <laughs> Over a few years, like when Norm came back to host, he said, I want to do another Larry King. But the reason it's my favorite is I know SNL had done Larry King in the past, but they never really, they just made fun of him for wearing his overalls. I fucking nailed Larry King for who he was, which is like this phony, ass-kissing, promotional, and I really went for it. And I think it came off in that bit. Oh I particularly love the close-up. Yes. Yes. Portrayal is insane. <laughs> yeah. I, come on, Dr. B jokes like, um, if there's if something's like, a, the more I think about it, the more I appreciate gravity. <laughs> Who would possibly say that? 
Norm McDonald. Norm, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so uh, you have Norm, Tracy Morgan, Will Ferrell, who we both adore. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will tell you, just in, in, in reading this, leading up to this, I'm most impressed with the fact that you have an endorsement by Dave Koechner. What? How did that happen? David did one season on Saturday Night Live. Do you remember him? Yeah, no, I he was great. I, I remember the um, the old Fops. No. Yeah, the, from like the Renaissance era. Fops. Right. We yeah. called them the Fops. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. yeah the Fops. That was Amazing. brilliant with him and Mark McKinney. David only lasted one season. Typical of like Chris Rock, Ben Stiller, many great people only were at SNL one year, including David. Right. But obviously, David's career has flourished since leaving Saturday Night Live right. as a character actor. We've kept in touch. I brought him up to the Montreal Comedy Festival like the summer after he left Saturday Night Live and wrote stuff for him. He does this character. Um, it's a comedian bombing. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Yes. Yeah. It's hilarious. Oh, but that was it. that's a bit where people who don't really get comedy are watching him going, why is this funny? These jokes are bad. <laughs> but people like you think it's genius because... He seems so real that he believes in the jokes he's saying, but they're not funny. And after each joke, he goes, no. Like, <laughs> like his brain's telling himself, no, that didn't work. Let's reset and he's that. like sweating, and I just love it. He, so he's great. we became really good friends after the month. We weren't really friends at SNL, but once he left the show, we became friends. And so for years, I've been writing stuff with him, performing, yeah. Yeah. But you also wrote for the award show, right? For the for the guild. I like, executive produced can it. We, can we talk about that Absolutely. too? Absolutely. Well, and speaking of, so David has appeared as a presenter on that show. For I've done the show seven years. I've probably had him four or five years. Wow. He just came on a few weeks ago and did the show. But he's great on that. And what we write for him is, you know, it's the room full of Hollywood's most prestigious writers. It could be Aaron Sorkin or Shonda Rhimes or J.J. Abrams. And David's attitude is he comes up and goes, what's up, leftist pussies? <laughs> <laughs> and he just basically shits on writers. He says things like, so I hear it's an award show. You're having a little, a little award show. Isn't that cute? He goes, here's what I think of writers. They hand me a script. I look at it. It sucks. And then I make it funny. And he just says all that to a room. And he kills. But, you know, David has the confidence to pu pull off that character. Yeah, he's He's great. Yeah. Ever since Anchorman. He, uh, he, Champ he, Kind. He killed it. He I killed love it. Anchorman. Did you like Anchorman 2? Not as much as much. the first one. The thing I loved about it was him. Didn't he have a restaurant where they, he said, sold bat meat? <laughs> oh, Remember my God. That? It was horrifying. <laughs> and he's like, they shot him doing a commercial for this bat meat, but there's bats flying around. It was just oh creepy. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. Crazy. Is it different to write for men than women? Um, not create. I mean, the process isn't different. I'd say that only in the sense that, no, the, the short answer is no. No. Because funny women and funny men are the same. Yeah. What do you do other than comedy? If you didn't, let's say, that's your go-to, I'm sure, like, um, when you are have a moment. Like, how do you decompress? from writing or is it your violin like what it's are violin, the things that it's going to like here's what people are surprised to hear about me is i love serious sad tragic drama and scary stuff that's my outlet i don't like comedy when i'm not working so i generally won't watch half hour situation comedies i don't really like feature comedy films there's exceptions, but I generally like ro romantic comedies. Not, yeah, not no my rom thing. Uh, rom yeah. Not my thing. Um, so what's your what's your favorite movie? Like um, Marathon Man. Okay. And Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. Um, that was that, a great that's movie. That's taking it back. A few Let's years. Say, okay. How about um, do you know? Um, uh, it's Sean Penn, Tim Robbins, and Laura Linney. I think I just saw this. They just recently played it. Um, it's hor It's really, really sad and tragic. That's not Mystic River. Yes, thank Mystic you. River. Yes, thank okay. you. Mystic River. Okay. Mystic River. That's definitely one of my favorite movies. I mean, that's terrible. It's, it's hor I right? Won't, I won't let it's my so watch sad. It. Right. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's brutal. <laughs> Honestly, that's my outlet. 
Really? And I pro it's not like that stuff affects me in a bad way. I just, I think because I have the emotion so much of laughter and all that, that stuff obviously isn't. So that's, that's your dark place? My dark place. Because I find that most comedians have a dark side to them. Yeah. yeah. You, is that your dark side? That's one. That would be one of them for sure that I'm attracted to. And even, I don't like slasher scary movies, but I like really. Like Freddy Krueger? That's not you scary. Know, train yeah. spotting. I thought train, train spo spotting. I couldn't watch it. Really? Yeah. That's not a slasher. No, but it's one of those dark, yes. dark movies. So there was that... a series on um, Netflix a couple years ago about the beginning of solving serial killer crimes. Okay. Like inventing the forensics to capture serial killers. But it was really depressing because they used real cases. Loved it. I loved it. You ate it. I couldn't. <laughs> and when it, was, when it stopped, I'm like, oh, uh, I want the show to go forever. You need another season. You should, you should have them. Uh, you, maybe you can produce another I would, season. I would love to. But so that, that is my outlet. I have a question. Do you think social media now? Everybody is funny. Everybody's a comedian. Everybody's, a, you know, you, everybody thinks they're funny because they have 15 seconds on a vine. How do you feel, or do you feel, that social media, those platforms, have affected the, um, I want to say sanctity, but purity of oh, what real comedy is? That's a great question. Is? Yes, they have in a bad way. And here's all I'll tell you how is that just because somebody can write funny tweets, and there's obviously many people who can write funny tweets doesn't make you a professional comedy writer. And here's why, is you can sit in the privacy of your own home day after day or week after week or whatever and write funny tweets. That's a very different process than being paid by a talk show host or a comic to go, okay, by tomorrow, I need 20 jokes <clears throat> about this subject. It's just a disconnect. And a lot of, there's a confusion now of someone going, well, my tweets get 2 million views and they're funny. It's like. Yeah, they're funny in the context of someone who's not expecting anything of you. Like, you're not a hired comedy writer. You're just some guy. They're reading your stuff. The stakes are different. Try being under the pressure of having to write jokes for Will Ferrell or for right. whomever. So I just find that it does hurt the sanctity. It sort of has lowered the profession because it makes everybody think that they can do it. I agree. You do? I do, 100%. Mm -hmm. and, and and like as a follow up to that, how important to you is like that immediate feedback you get from the audience? Well, like, I ego know, I said, wise, it's huge, right? I mean, like yeah. if you write a you write a bit for SNL, or you write a joke for Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon, right? And you they do their monologue, and it kills it. That's great feedback, right? I would say that I may not have pers someone personally telling me, "Hey, that was a funny joke," but if I hear you know, a room full of people at Carnegie Hall laughing or whatever, that's pretty good feedback. Verif verification that uh, you, you have some degree of humor. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> well, and to continue on this path, this conversation that we're, we're having, you also, comedy is something that is taught, right? There's like, you also teach writers how to write comedy, how to write sketch. Can you tell us a little bit about sure. that? I think I'm going to tell... For example, the um, the Harvard class and Chapman, by the way. So I'm teaching Chapman. Oh, you're doing Chapman too. And I've, wow, by the way, I've okay. never even been to the campus. I've heard it's beautiful, but they now have one of the top five film and TV programs in the country. So I'm going to be going to Chapman in person, and Harvard. My my nephew's at Chapman. Very good. Have him take the I class. don't think he wants to take fair uh, enough. Go, go into entertainment, but maybe. Uh, but you let me know when I'll you're there. You know. I'll tell him to take your class. Exactly. So yeah, I you am got to give him an A though. Mm, okay, my, I'm going to tell the uh, students, I'm going to go, look, I can't make you funny. Don't have any misunderstanding here. If you're not funny, sadly, I can't make you funny. If you are funny, there's a good chance that I can tap into your, your, what makes you funny and help you develop that talent into a real way. That I'm confident I can do. But you know, a lot of people who study comedy or who try stand-up, they're not funny. And sadly, oh, I, no class or anything's going to help them. But it's not my place to make that decision for them. I mean, it's funny. I have a friend. Uh, his name is Lowell Sanders. He's a comedian, and he tours with Tim Allen. And I know Lowell. He's you a good, do? Yeah, because Tim and I used to be managed by the same manager. Oh wow! Yeah, many, and many he years. Toured so I know with Lowell. Joe, Lowell. Okay, so Lowell's one of my best friends. Yeah. And I call Lowell one day, and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to take this stand-up comedy class. 
And he starts laughing at me. And he's like, Beth, he calls me Beth. He's like, Beth, you don't learn stand up. It's it was, gotta it's be like, in like you. a real life Comiskey method. Yeah. <laughs> Which I've never seen, but I get the reference. Oh, it, was, it was great. Yeah. It was actually really entertaining. It, um, the yeah, you can't I mean, but isn't there isn't there I mean there there is a way to deliver, right? In terms of a cadence and whatnot with an audience when you're doing stand up that I would think would be teachable. I don't know about that because every comedian has their own way of what you're saying, their own cadence and delivery. So you could help someone maybe improve their cadence if they have one. But some people are just so lost, they don't have a cadence, so you can't even fake that. It's an I, odd I, skill. I could, I could never do stand-up. Do it. I, could, I just, I, it, it makes me sweat just thinking about it. A, lo a lot of people say that it's a huge fear. And it's not even about, pu I'm fine public speaking. Mm -hmm. I have no problem with that. Right. That doesn't frighten that doesn't me. It doesn't frighten me at all. But there, 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 maybe it's just the fear factor of bombing, you know, in real time that I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know Al Lubell, you might know his name, great comedian. He won Star Search when that show was on. He did a bunch of Letterman's, friend of mine. He's got this line, he goes, according to a recent study, the number one fear people have is public speaking. Number two fear they have is snakes. Public speaking number one, snakes number two. He goes, can you imagine a guy all alone stumbling through the desert? Oh my God, a podium. <laughs> <laughs> And there you go. Pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, I um, I have to say that reading your resume, Hugh, I am a huge fan. I mean, the, the stuff that you write, the the people that you've worked with, you know, is is just outstanding. What is your you had Carnegie Hall was your most memorable. Is there anything that you look back on that you maybe at the moment you thought was, I wouldn't say a fail, but it was something that didn't work, but then you learned from that and were able to incorporate, okay, I don't want to do this again. Sure. That's, um, and you cannot mention this podcast. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Because <laughs> um, I would like to think that I've learned from doing stuff. Um, well, yes, so I wrote a sketch when Tom Hanks hosted Saturday Night Live. Which With time? COVID? When we had this COVID? Was, uh, Which time? This is, no, like this is in the 90s. Oh, in the 90s. Way pre-COVID. Okay. And I wrote it for him and Jim Brewer. And I had, I had been to Italy that summer, and so Italy was on my mind, and you know I love to imitate. So I wrote a sketch that was completely in Italian, fake Italian, where Brewer and Tom Hanks, and what happens is they're in a restaurant. They're, they work at a restaurant. They get in a huge fight with each other. It'd be like... In, be, fake, in fake Italian. In fake Italian. So it'd be like... In America, and you're there in a romantic restaurant, and these two Italians just start fucking going off on each other. <laughs> so it ended up like they dumped over a fish aquarium, like it was violent, and it killed at the table. Read, <laughs> Lorne Michaels loved it. Tom Hanks loved it. What I didn't realize was, I wrote a funny sketch on paper, but then at SNL, you're expected to really. There is a director, but you need to know in your head the choreography of that sketch. And I hadn't thought about that. I had only thought about the jokes and being funny. So then we start rehearsing it. But is that is that all on you as the writer? It's kind of on you. The blocking and the choreography? Wow. I mean, the director will help, but put it this way, Lorne Michaels thinks it's on you. Okay. So if, so if something's not working, he's going to blame you. He's not going to blame the director. And I'm not really naturally good at that sort of physical stuff. But it became clear to me that oh my God, like Tom Hanks is turning to me and goes, so huge, should I, like, do I walk over to the aquarium from here or does Brewer push me against it? And I didn't have answers for him. And that's unlike me, because usually comedically, I know everything I want. But they were so concerned about the lack of choreography that they created another rehearsal just for my sketch, which is extraordinary, but that's because they, Lorne Michaels really wanted the sketch to succeed. It had done so well at the table read. But I have to say... It didn't even, translate? No, it still didn't work. Did it make the live show? No. Oh, okay. No, it didn't. Scrapped it. it. Scrapped it. But what that taught me was 
if you create something like that, you better connect all the dots and know just as a producer as well as writer, don't rely on other people to make it work. Because you're the creator, they're gonna ask you, you better have the answers. And like it was Tom Hanks and Jim Brewer and they were gracious, like they never said, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, but that's how I felt. I felt like I botched this. I could have made this sketch work had I spent more time thinking through how. But right, but it was also a learning experience for now that would probably never happen again. Well, I, I think it wouldn't happen again if I wrote a sketch that had that much. Physicality. Physicality. I would talk to someone who knew more than me, right? Yeah, I wouldn't rely just on, hey, it's funny, let's make it happen. But that's sort of how I felt at the time. So take us through the process of SNL. Like when you're a, a, a writer, how fast do you have to come up with material and turn that over? So you have until Wednesday morning because Wednesday morning you have, if, let's say the show's Saturday, you have to turn in your sketches for that week by Wednesday morning. So you have Sunday through Wednesday to write. But sadly, most people don't do any work so until have, like Tuesday. So you have two and I'm not kidding. Yeah. So you have 12 hours basically. But hey, if you want to start working Sunday, God bless. Right. Most people don't. So they pull all nighters starting Tuesday afternoon, stay through the night or till two in the morning, then go home. Um, yeah. Do you think now in, in clubs, because people have cell phones, they tape, that does that, do you think that affects the comedy that is in a room? Do you think comedians, or you as a writer, as a stand-up comedian, does it at times, is that in the back of your mind all the time? Keep in mind, I don't do tons of stand-up now, but if I were doing stand-up, yes, because I'm so tempted to talk about stuff that's controversial, so I'd be more aware of, okay, who's here, who's taping me? I would be thinking about it, for sure. Who's your favorite comedian? I don't have a favorite, but of sort of the current people, I think Bill Burr is great. You can be honest, they're not, none of them are watching this. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, John Mulaney is great. Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle, I both think are great. Right. Um, Brian Love Regan. Dave Chappelle. Who, you know Regan? Yeah. I've worked with. Fantastic. I like all of them. Oh, that's... What about uh, Tom Segura? Nate Bargatze? I, Segura's act, I don't know well. Nate, I like. I don't know, like my friends just paid to go see him in uh, Ventura. They overpaid? Well, I'm no. not gonna say that. I'm no. just saying, I wouldn't be excited. Like, oh, I'm going to see Nate. But I think he's good. I, I, I watched that late, latest special he did. He's, he's funny. You like him? He's funny. Yeah, he's like, uh, a, and he's PG thirteen. Is he? That's probably why. Which is like, it's hard. It's it's even harder, I think. Right? Yeah, it to, is harder. Yeah, it completely is harder. clean. I mean, he's clean. But he's like, clean. He's as just, is he's uh, just like re relatable. Jim Gaffigan is right. also PG thirteen, but he's a really strong comedian. As is Sebastian. I mean, he's he's Sebastian's really clean. <laughs> he's pretty clean. Yes, he and is. Funny. And yes, he connects. Yes. Oh, for sure. What is the one thing that you think, like, for our listeners or anybody out there that, that down the road, this is what they dream of doing? What is the one thing they should know? Like, there's, it, there's many things, but what is the one specific thing in comedy that if you don't have that element, it won't work? Well, I was thinking that you're going to be judged by your body of work. Like, if you have one great joke or one great routine, chances are that's not going to thrust you forward career-wise. And people make that mistake of, I did this thing and it was hilarious. It's like, yeah, but that's one thing. You have to keep, right. it's like a batter in baseball. You keep coming to the plate, and you keep coming to the plate, and you're going to strike out a lot. But once you build that reputation of having consistency so that Nate Bargatze, people want to pay to see him do an hour, like, that's hard. It's easier to do five minutes. To recreate an entire hour of new material. New material, exactly, yeah. right. So I think part of it is um, volume of quality, of volume, right? And then the other would be um, be true to your own comedic voice, meaning it's fine to be inspired or influenced by people, but if you start doing stuff that seems too much like them, well, then who are you? So know your voice. Have to. And by the way, some people don't have one. That's what's interesting is people with decent careers, like, yeah, but can you name one thing they said? No. 
that means they don't really have a voice. Right. I, I took pride in that at least people who know my stand up can quote bits of mine. Right. Well, like, so, like a voice or like a shtick? A shtick, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, like voice. Yeah. You're, you're, by voice, I mean your comedic, comedic persona. Voice. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Your comedic voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't have a shtick. That's okay. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> that's I, can still, right. I can operate, though. So, that's all, it works. I hear you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I did a sketch comedy show for Instagram. I wrote, co wrote with uh, two other ladies. Um, we did 32 sketches, and probably we had Dave Batista come on, mm -hmm. but probably out of the 32, I would say that two were really, you know, right. I thought were really good. Did you end with one of the strong ones? I started and ended. That's smart. Yeah. You always want to leave the audience on a positive beginning and end, and you get away with more in the middle. Well, Hugh, it's such a pleasure to meet you. And, you know, unfortunately, we're running out of time. It flew by. I know. We'd love to have you back, right, Dr. Brenner? Let's do it. Let's do it. There's Absolutely. so much Anytime. more we need to tap into. We'll do a part into. two to this. Yes. So, you know, for our listeners, um, we'd love for you to either give them your social media. Let's say we have somebody out there that wants a, do you do private coaching? I do. So if you go to um, hughfink.com. Okay. H-U-G-H-F-I-N-K.com. I'm always posting on there. If I'm starting to do any new workshops, lately I've been asked to do private coaching for corporate people. Um, believe it or not, someone asked me to write a eulogy for their loved one. Wow. They were very nervous and there was a lot of people attending, but they wanted it to be funny. It was funny. They, they did. They wanted heartfelt but funny. Good. I can do heart, but it's got to, obviously if you're hiring me, it's because you want humor. And um, it was in Illinois, Chicago, and the guy told me afterwards, he said, the priest said it was the greatest eulogy he'd ever heard. Oh. That really made me feel good. Someone that you knew or just, oh. just they found stranger? Me. Stranger. Complete stranger. That's a gift. Professional. It was really, you know, it made me feel good that he said when he read the draft that I sent him, he and his wife, they cried. That's oh. incredible. And it's like, again, I don't try to say that I can write heart-wrenching stuff, but of course I included some stuff that was heartfelt, but it was funny. But they gave me all this information about his uncle who died. So I knew stuff about the uncle, I knew stuff about his family, his career, but that's, you give me that, I can make it funny. I, I think I have a new business venture for you. Please, we'll talk. Wedding vows. What, oh, believe it or not, there's already a business. Come on. People already do that. No, for you. Oh, for me, no, yeah. I mean, I'll be on the high end of it. Yeah. There's a lot of people out there hiring people to write best man toasts, wedding toasts, it's out there. Yeah. Well, you know, they say comedy comes from tragedy, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. <laughs> I, you know, in my stand-up, I now do, I talk about taking my daughter to Knott's Berry Farm, which I call the Disneyland for white trash. Yeah. <laughs> and I say how there's that ride where you have to be a certain height to get on it. So my daughter forced me to go on, the, I think it was called the Hurricane, and I hate those rides. And I go, the employee at um, Knott's, he goes, sir, I just got to tell you, um, you might think this is going to be fun, but when you get on, you're thrust down a dark tunnel, 115 miles an hour, that seems like it's never going to end. Um, you're going to experience nausea, potentially throw up in your mouth. Perfect. And I go, oh, so you've been married too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I love it. I think yes. we have to end on that. <laughs> on. So great. one more time, if you could write it to camera. like. You Think.com, H-U-G-H-F-I-N-K, dot com, workshops, my stand-up appearances, TV appearances, check it out. Thanks for listening to Beyond the OR with Dr. B. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, connect with Dr. B on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Kevin Brenner MD and KevinBrennerMD.com. Until next time.